we're kicking off today's show in Nashville, Tennessee, with historical fiction author Annette H. Valentine. Annette's debut novel is Eastbound from Flagstaff. It was published last fall through Morgan James. And it tells the story of a young man in transition during the 1920s. And he's an individual who comes to recognize the significance of family, loyalty, and the richness of heritage, a coming-of-age story. And then her next one is coming out in a couple months here. It's taking place between 1921 and 1942. So it's a second installment. It's all part of a trilogy. And this tells the story of Gracie Maxwell, a woman who fights for her heritage during World War II. So Mm. I encourage you to go to Annette's website. It's AnnetteHValentine.com. Of course, you get her books on Amazon, pre-order, all that good stuff. Um, And also talk to your local independent bookstore, too, to get her books on their shelves, uh, digital or not. So, Annette, welcome. How are you? I'm doing well. What a lovely introduction. Thank you, Lisa. It's so nice to be on your show. Thank you for inviting me. And Nancy, happy birthday, I guess. Oh, no, it's Lisa's birthday. <laughs> yeah, Lisa's birthday. Well, yes, happy birthday. Yes. I know. We do a test on, on who's saying what when. <laughs> it's difficult over here. It's we sound alike sometimes. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you. Yes, and another another year older, you know, it's just more experiences uh-huh. to add. That's how it is. <laughs> but that's, but it's, you think about that. Um, both of your stories, uh, especially Eastbound from Flagstaff, of course, we come from Arizona, so we hear Flagstaff immediately. We're like, ooh. Um, but, you know, the stories, Eastbound from Flagstaff, as I was saying in the beginning, is kind of a coming-of-age story, right? That's exactly right. And Flagstaff enters in because uh, the main character, who is Simon Hagen, uh, Flagstaff becomes a destination for him. It offers a second chance, if you will. And in Simon's case, a second and a third chance. So most of us do make mistakes from time to time. So it's nice to be able to have a, a second or a third start. But but that's the main character, and that's how Flagstaff enters into the story. But it originates in a rural town in Kentucky called Elton, Kentucky, and uh, Simon makes a circuitous route um, from from that small town in Kentucky to a whopper of a city, Detroit, in the 1920s. Mm, Big contrast wow. for mm. Elton, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Mm. Wow. I'm thinking about that because, you know, we've been through Arizona. We did a little bit of Kentucky last year. We were in uh, Washington County, <clears throat> excuse me, and now we're right outside Detroit. So I'm kind of feeling we're, <laughs> we're following in, in his footsteps. Well, um, you're you touching know. all the bases, yes. Hey, why not? And we didn't get to Na- – we did drive through Nashville, but um, hopefully we'll get there this year while we're twirling around the south uh, and the north and the midwest, <laughs> wherever we end up well, in an interesting so. year. Yeah, yeah, so. absolutely. Nashville's a great city. Yeah. It's interesting because didn't you have a design, an interior design business uh, over the years out of Nashville <laughs> and also Indiana and oh, Indiana? I- I absolutely did. I had a 34-year career as a professional interior designer, and in 2016, I sold that business and shifted gears to become a full-time writer. Um, I guess I jumped from one creative field to another, but I've always liked writing, short stories, and essays and journaling. So I I did shift a bit to focus on writing and have thoroughly enjoyed the new career. Uh, 34 Hmm. years as an interior designer was quite a wonderful ride. I enjoyed that so much and uh, I'm enjoying writing. So creative on both, on both careers. Hmm. Cool. And Hey, there's always digging because interior design, you never know what's behind that wallpaper. (laughs) <laughs> you're still digging so for, you know the stories behind the walls but when when you look at eastbound from flagstaff that's your first book where was the inspiration to get started with this novel I, doesn't it stem from your family history well you know it does the inspiration for that one in particular is the backstory of my father's life it is based on loosely based on my father uh perhaps the reality of of what made him who he was and and maybe why he might have missed out on his dreams or at least he he thought he had missed out on on dreams but it's the it is the legacy he passed down um not only his, uh, my father but his father um, 
it's an unmistakable model of strength. So Mm -hmm. my inspiration did come as a result of my father's perseverance. I could see that clearly through my growing up years. And also my grandfather's um, strength and his perseverance was Mm -hmm. transferred down to um, my father as part of my grandfather's legacy. So I am um, just uh, very keen on legacy, and um, it's a huge source of pride for me. So so my inspiration did come from my father's just mm. doggedness. So did you do a lot of family history research? I mean, were you on Ancestry.com a lot? <laughs> You know, I, I hate to admit, I've never been on Ancestry.com. I, <laughs> I simply connected the dots. I, I, I said I'm kind of like a little bird all my life collecting uh, material, all my growing up years um, correct, collecting things that I didn't really know that I was going to use for a story, but um, gather those strings and twiglets and so on, maybe some occasional oddities like a bird does, and uh, tie those into a story. But, um, of course, oh. there are bridges in there that uh, connect the episodes. They're, they're what's fix, fictional. But, uh, you know, even those fictional bridges became real to me because they were um, like honest-to-goodness truths. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I did uh, start with family history, the things that I knew, and then kind of connected the dots or crossed the bridges with with fictionalizing my family story. I like that. I like really how you're cool. speaking. It's all about fictional yeah. bridges, you know, family history yeah. bridges, and birds, and I'm thinking how birds collect things into a nest, and I'm like, you're exactly. very visual. Just even how you speak, it's like, okay, this is cool. I want to dig into your novel. Jeez. Yeah, I'm an interior designer and <laughs> yeah, too. So yes, I'm physical. very visual. Yeah, yeah. They make it physical. It's mm. cool. Mm. Absolutely. Now you might think of a movie. Yeah. Mm. I'm thinking mm. of a movie. I hope. Yeah. I hope a producer's thinking of a movie. Knock <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> knock, <Not, not> everybody. <laughs> well, down yeah. to the Potter's House. How does that? That's a new one coming out um, in November, right? It comes out. Um, yeah, How, it's available for pre-order, but it will be out on November the 3rd. Oh, okay, good. So everyone, pre-order, that's a good word. Um, get that mm-hmm. up there because it helps authors also become bestsellers pretty fast. So uh, that's a, it's a good word. <laughs> you can be the first on the block to get it. Uh, but a good. digital block, how about that? Uh, down how to the that? Potter's House, how does that connect? How does Gracie connect with, you know, with Simon or does she? She absolutely does connect, but uh, uh, the link comes at the very end of Eastbound oh. from Flagstaff. But the inspiration for for Down to the Potter's House um, actually fell into my lap uh, because of a secret that Gracie Maxwell really held most of her life, and I found that secret to be. <laughs> incredibly challenging. Uh, It was one I just could not let go of. Uh, Based on Mm. nine words from an elderly woman on her deathbed was the inspiration for the story. And it's a spoiler alert if I were to tell you what those nine words are, but it's amazing uh, what can trigger an entire um, 100 word novel, 100,000 word novel from nine words, but that's precisely what uh, launched my inspiration for Down to the Potter's House. And it is based on Gracie Maxwell's life and the secret that she held for most of her life. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this is scandal in Mysterious. there. Mysterious. So did you find, Mysterious. did you get good gossip doing all the research and did you create, <laughs> you, you, I mean, were there, yeah, I mean, there's gossip involved with history. That's what Nancy well, always there's says. there's got to be well, gossip it involved. Is. <laughs> there has to be gossip and um, of course, all of those juicy things. Is. Yeah, absolutely. Is gossip, you know, people telling in each other what happened. Yeah, mm-hmm. it's, and it's in way its more interesting. Way. You know, if you t- if yeah. you took kids in in um, high school and said, "Okay, you're taking a class on gossip," it'd be way more interesting to them than history. Mm. Well, you should, said, is, yeah, <laughs> you should think about that. Yeah, it's gossip from the 1800s. 
<laughs> I think it'd be a I think it'd be very popular. Yeah. You know, gossip. What's the third book? I'm just putting the trilogy together in my head here. Well, the third book is it's entitled Sufficient Sacrifice. That one will be twenty twenty one. But it's a culmination uh. of the two um threads of legacy that come down through both families. So um, mm. uh, it, it, yeah, as I say, it's a culmination of the two patriarchal influences um, in the trilogy, the uh, thread of grace that goes through one family and the death grip of immorality and lies that goes through another family. Ooh. And the, just the, um, just the, the fallout from both of those um, legacies and and the heritage that comes out of two families down to the to the fourth and fifth generations. But you know, on a serious note, I've hoped to portray the supreme value that abounds in a father's legacy. So in the trilogy, we have Gracie Maxwell's father in comparison to Simon Hagen's father. Mm -hmm. And just what happens through the generations. And it's so true that what is passed down from one generation to the next um, is a, it just a tremendous impact and can start with one, one man and what he has to um, deliver to his, uh, for his heritage down to his ancestors. So uh, it has a, a bit of intrigue, but I think the comparison between the two um, families is um, – very uh, imposing. Mm. Uh, you know, I think checking through your family history is is really interesting. I know I did a bit with mine, and I found out things none of the rest of the family ever wants to talk about. You know, I found I have more than one birth certificate with different people's names. <laughs> and then, oh, well, did you say you had it, more than one birth certificate? Is that what you yes, said? Yes. And, <laughs> um, and you know, I found my father was a little bit um, uh, married to different people at the same time. <laughs> and now there's you a know. book there. there yeah. There's a book for sure. <laughs> for sure. It, it, well, I think what's also interesting, Funny. I mean, isn't it when you dig into, you know, there's all the skeletons in the closet and literally oh, sure. the different generations really did want to keep everything under wraps and yeah the younger generations sure. now are still having a hard time getting the skeletons because we want to know and mm -hmm. then you really want to know because the good the bad and the beautiful and the ugly because then mm -hmm. it helps you understand who you are your, what's in your dna and so i, I think it's an interesting thing to go in yeah. there and also understand that Things were different back then. At any point oh, in your sure. research of everything, did you have to kind of go, okay, this was different. Like right now we would be no, 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 or yay, 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 but then it was different back then. So are you asking if it, if it's relevant or if today's mores, if we want to call them mores, if they're so mm. different that you really wouldn't think it was, think what something might have, have been taboo in the 1920s. Yeah. Well, it's okay yeah. now. Is that what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, all of that. It's kind yeah. of a little bit of everything. It's, you know, there's even just fashion or there's just mm -hmm. certain things we did back then that now we go, no, we shouldn't have. Or, hey, we need to bring those things back. I mean, that's what's oh. so interesting about digging in. There's good and bad. You know, there's beautiful and ugly. And, you know, I well, think it's important to have the cards out on the table. I think that's part of the beauty of mm -hmm. historical fiction. But there's silly things, too. Like, I remember my grandmother being so excited that she got to wear a pair of pants, you know, and and that, that was mm -hmm. a big deal, like, mm -hmm. just coming through World War II, that women mm -hmm. got to wear pants only because <laughs> they went worked in factories. Otherwise, it was non allowed, and there was all these... all all the major cities like San Francisco and LA had laws against women wearing pants and they called it cross dressing. Now today mm, when we talk isn't about that cross dressing, yeah, it's something yeah. completely different comes to your mind. Mm -hmm. 
But, I mean, it was actually against the law for women to wear a pair of pants. It's still cross <laughs> oh, uh, oh, I'm sure. Well, even even more minute is the fact that I had my ears pierced, and I know I was <gasps> early Bad. 20s, and it's like, oh, no, that's that's really not oh. what nice girls do. That's right. But, yeah, I think we do <laughs> learn from the past, though. I mean, that's so much being said today in today's world that you know look to the past um for what you can learn from other generations and yeah i mean things have changed i think it wouldn't hurt us to to go back and say what's valuable from the past that mm-hmm. we can um i don't know that we can go back and start over but you can certainly start today and and use what you know today that's valuable and never mind um uh, what was right or wrong uh, in in terms of mm-hmm. minor things like ear piercing, um, yeah, there's they're just funny. values that we need to say that are the the indelible um, things that we need to accept, the indelible marks on our lives that we need to say are valuable, and and some are valuable, and some need to be discarded. But yeah, I think mm-hmm. there's a lot to be learned from the past. And For and sure. with this going, especially in your family history, I mean it. This isn't really like a you know a biography of your family, so this is still fiction. So you're kind of you're drawing mm-hmm. the inspiration, but you're still creating your own gossip. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> <Cool>. uh, <laughs> well, yeah, it is. It's definitely fictionalized, but you know sometimes it, it did seem like the story of my father was not fictionalized because every scene became so vivid and and uh so many things so many characteristics about Simon Hagen I knew to be true and they simply came to life on the page so mm. i mean even in the instance of one of my brothers who had read the first draft and he began to i call it internalize um some mm. of the things that i fictionalized cuz he pointed to well i remember when uh for instance and he gave an example. I can't even think what mm. that, that example mm. was. And it's like, Joe, that, that didn't happen. <laughs> mm. I made that up. Um, but, you know, when you when you well, tie together something that's rather poignant, poignant and and you begin to be able to visualize it, it almost mm. becomes real. So sometimes it is hard to separate, you know, did this happen or or did it not? Obviously, the, the the big things, whether they were true or false, you know. But some of the details, it's like, oh, I can't even remember if that actually happened or did I just create that? Or did it come well, to life on its own? And that happens, too. Well, if you can see that person doing that particular thing, it's not out of the person's character, then it's easy to, oh, yeah, they probably did it, you know. Mm. Or is mm-hmm. it something that you know for sure? It's like, oh, I don't believe my father would have ever done anything like that or ever said that. Then it, mm-hmm. then you have the opposite reaction. But if it's something within um, the character that he was, it's easy to, I think he must have done this and he could have done that. You know. Mm-hmm. That is yeah. that is really uh, a true statement because um, staying true to the heart of the story was. Mm-hmm crucial for me I mean I fully Mm. intended at every turn to honor the memory of my father so I say Simon's past but I did that diligently and um, Mm. I had an editor who wanted me to to um, insert some scenes that just went completely contrary Mm. to my father's core the person Mm -hmm. that I knew him to be and I couldn't I could Mm -hmm. not I would not change Mm -hmm. him for the sake of that scene and yeah. um, I, I'm, you know, that that's been one of the um, tremendous satisfactions for me to have written that book. On, you know, it became a tribute to my father. I had no wow. idea I was starting it as hmm. a tribute to my father, and um, just that satisfaction from having come full circle to to knowing the truth about him, knowing who he was and what he has passed down to his children and grandchildren uh, is a huge statement of the man that he was. And so oh, to be able to, nice. to say, stay true to that, um, I'm very pleased uh, that I didn't compromise. Uh, in fact, 
I discovered the most wonderful man through through writing Eastbound Bound from Flagstaff, mm-hmm. and it and it's a man who deserved my honor and respect. So mm-hmm. um, it's respect that's, well deserved. So um, I so think I'm that's a really interesting pleased. project for mm-hmm. folks. Maybe not go to the length of what you've done. You know, is to kind of just even jot down or journal family members' lives and kind of their mm-hmm. characters. Mm-hmm. Maybe for youth, mm-hmm. especially youth, to kind of mm-hmm. have a, to create more of an understanding and understand like you, perseverance comes through like as the main mm-hmm. word for both the novels and the trilogy itself and just talking with you. It's, that seems to be the word. And mm-hmm. anyone who has perseverance, perseverance is really hard. To be to persevere. You were a small business owner. You know you had to work really, really hard. And there's yeah, days you go, never I don't want to do this. <laughs> and you have to still get up and go. There's something that that perseverance and drive that has that's there. Mm-hmm. But I think it's yeah. really important for folks to understand people with perseverance, learn how to have that, foster that skill, that trait, but also understand mm-hmm. that people with perseverance, they're not perfect. They need right. compassion, I think. Yeah. And, you know, it's a foundational strength that's there. You know, you can say, well, I'm going to get up and I'm going to do this uh, no matter what. But you have to have derived that from something deep within you. And I call it found foundational strength. But mm-hmm. to the point that you made that it would be a, a, a good exercise or a good project for young people to just kind of jot down the aspects of different members of their families, especially the older generations, and say, you know, well, <laughs> where did that get that? Well, how is that working for them? And, you know, as it trickles down mm-hmm. through the years, uh, what impact did that have on their generations? And did they leave anything of value for me as a, as a young person um, in this generation? Mm-hmm. And, and just kind of uh, do some comparisons, and it's kind of interesting to see uh, where foundational strength comes from and where um, weakness comes from. And it may not mm-hmm. be one person, but it, it's their philosophy, the way they live their lives, and mm-hmm. and the way they um, guided their children, and then their children guided their children. Um, that's mm-hmm. what I refer to as um, a thread of grace that just comes down to to benefit generation after generation. And the and opposite of that Gracie. is true, true, too. Gracie Maxwell. And I've got Gracie. That's right. See, I like Gracie. that. Well, I like that, that, you know, here she is, too. Also, you know, perseverance and that foundation of faith and trust to move forward. And, um, you know, that's that's the thing, too, when you think about what you've written and what you're continuing to, to write, I think is also really important of times of, like, this year is testing everyone's, mm. you know, Mm-hmm. Every string that we have, it's it's testing us all. And unless you're not For out there sure. living, if you know, if you're <laughs> sitting there with you know bonbons and champagne every day and not worried, yeah. you know, who does that? You're not. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know how that happens. But even your TV is not the same. If you, look, you know, nothing's the same. So, um, you know, and your pool boy is not going to be the same either. I'm just saying. So when you when you look at now this year, how important your style of writing is and your books, because it is, and and you're putting history in people. That's the thing that history textbooks leave out. There's the stories of the people. Mm. That is so sweet. Thank you. I appreciate that because it it is true. Uh, we have to hit some serious notes. Uh, it's nice to laugh, and it's 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 great to have some outlets but really we're in serious times and we need to to find where we're going to get our strength to live day to day Mm. but you know all generations go through something i mean i can't imagine what it would be like to live through world war ii Mm. when you're living in fear and and i know that from my grandmother that things were rationed you couldn't just go buy whatever you wanted Mm. you had to stand in line to get in the grocery store and have a ticket and you're only allowed to buy so much, you know, it, um, I think every generation has had its hardships. It's just, 
what you personally think, oh, well, that doesn't sound that hard to me, but this sounds way more harder over there, you know? Mm-hmm. But, mm-hmm. It, you know, and, and our roles have changed. Like, looking at the role of women, it's really changed a lot. So, you know, some of the burdens we face today as women are, it seems easier than when women weren't considered hardly people and had equal, to, yeah. to be, mm-hmm. yeah, to be, you know, equal to, to other men. I mean, like, keep in mind them, you know, men had the vote and we didn't for a long, long time. It, having to fight for basic rights, mm-hmm. you know, th- that's something that's that, tough. Yeah. 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 Very tough. So, mm-hmm. Well, in fact, I watched a movie not too long ago. It had Russell Crowe, and I can't think of the name of it, but it was during the Great Depression, and just seeing um, right on the screen, I mean, portrayed mm-hmm. how people suffered with no food, selling mm-hmm. you know pencils on the streets, and, and yeah. it was based on a true story, but, of course, millions of people went through the Depression, but that one story was just mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. – blatantly yeah. clear how much suffering took p- place in families that had no food and they had to mm-hmm. give their children away. I mean, it was heartbreaking. It was, I yeah. felt so guilty after, not guilty, but, you know, it's like some of my complaints are so petty compared to, compared some, to of the, uh, yeah, some of the suffering yeah. that's gone in the past. But but mm-hmm. when we're living it day to day, our suffering's as real as as real mm-hmm. as anybody's. Yeah. Yeah, right. You know, um, I I want to play. Please remember me. I was going to play this at the end of the show, but I'm going to dedicate it to your dad, because I think Aww. that's what you've done. I want to play that <laughs> for you. And in, in, uh, in closing, and I want I don't want to stop our conversation, but you know, the time the time manager is ticking on me. But I do want to invite <laughs> you back on the show to continue the conversation and also talk about what you're doing to end slavery, modern day slavery, and sex trafficking. Mm. Um, oh, something awesome. very oh, dear to our so heart, much. I'd be happy and to. we would love to have you on a show to talk about that because mm-hmm. um, it's super important. We've done shows on yeah, it before, it and there's still a lot of people that don't believe in it um, that ah, it's happening, that and it's happening. Don't yeah. believe it's happening. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. happening in your neighborhood. It's happening in yeah, your school. So um, you know, it's really important. So especially tied into you know, look at history and how slavery has been part of history mm-hmm. on all different levels, all different cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, again, we're going from the past to the present, and I think you're one of those conduits that help us understand. So thank you for what you do. Well, thank you for giving me a voice, and um, I I just really appreciate being on your show. It's been a pleasure. It has. And everyone, again, uh, go to Annette's website. It's AnnetteHValentine.com. Can't beat that last name. Uh, so yeah. AnnetteHValentine.com. Again, the books are eastbound from Flagstaff. You can get that now. So get start reading in time for November. Uh, and you can pre-order the sequel. It's called Down to the Potter's House. So you want to get started. There's no better time than now to read a really good historical book. And I want coffee. With a little potty mm-hmm. in there. All right. Just saying. All right. I want coffee and, <laughs> and your books, and I'm happy for a day. <laughs> That's the awesome thing. So, uh, everyone, again, <laughs> and that's hvalentine.com. And here's the song, Please Remember Me. And uh, this is by written by Ted DeGrazia, the famous Arizona artist. We were talking about his uh, gallery that you can visit during normal circumstances in Tucson, Arizona. But they found his manuscripts of his music and his son and also the jazz uh, ensemble from the uh, Tucson the University recreated his music and created an album and this is the title track from it and you can see more about that at degrazia.org so here it is please remember me thanks so much Annette thank you y'all be safe you too, you too. take care take care <laughs> 